as you can see behind me here, we're experiencing the change that we go through every day in our life. We all go through things. There's times in our life when we're in a desert season. Sometimes we're in a, a very plush season in our life. How do you go through these changes in your life? Why don't you come check us out here in New Covenant? We go live every Sunday morning at our website, newcovenantpa.com. We're also live on Facebook at New Covenant PA. And you can catch our edited versions at New Covenant Port Author on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel. Check it out. See what we've done in the past. See where we're headed. See what God is doing here at our facility. God is moving mightily. We are in this series, The Change, the change that we all go through. How do you handle the change that you experience as a believer? I'm going to go ahead and dismiss all the kiddos between the ages of 4 and 10 to Children's Church. This is the chaotic time when the kids start running like crazy. I've had people ask me, why do you do that? It kind of disrupts the service, you know? It kind of disrupts things. You know what? Let me tell you something. Kids need to see us worshiping, yeah, all right? Because all, if all they ever see is us screaming and hollering at the TV, you know, when when some your favorite team is winning the football game or when your favorite race car is out front, if that's the only time they ever see you screaming and shouting, how are they ever going to know to worship? Let me tell you something, parents, grandparents, it's your responsibility to teach your children how to worship. Because if you don't teach them how to worship, Satan will. Y'all didn't, y'all, y'all missed that one. I'm going to give you one more opportunity to shout at that one. If you don't teach your children or your grandchildren how to worship, Satan will. And I'm going to tell you right now, he's very good at his job. He is very good at his job. Not, not that his job is a good job, but he knows it very well. He knows every trick. He knows every way to deceive you. He is the arch deceiver. And if you don't teach your children or your grandchildren how to honor God with your life, he'll teach you how to stay away from him. Guaranteed. I want to let you know and I want to remind everybody that at 2 p.m. today that uh, Kingdom Zoo is going to be here. They're going to be here uh, at, at New Covenant. They're going to be uh, uh, just like the last time they were here. They, they bring all sorts of different animals. And, and, and the guy, when he preaches, I mean, he, he ties everything in. And it, it is a very powerful message in, in creation and how God used or how God uses each one of the animals. And, and it's really a very powerful message. I want to encourage you, uh, even if you don't have kids, uh, come anyway and, and, and pay attention to what he's going to say because he, he does the deliver a very powerful message, a very, a very uh, strong message. So I want you to make sure that you put that on your calendar. That's today at 2 p.m. Everybody say today, today. 2 p.m. Where are you going to be? That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Next week, Danny is going to be here preaching. Come on, Danny. Give a shout out to Danny. Looking all slick in his green today. But uh, I don't care about wearing green. But anyway, I match my wife. You match yours. Looking great. <laughs> but uh, Danny, Danny, is, uh, Danny has a call on his life. Many of you already know that. Danny, uh, God's hand is on Danny, and, and God is going to use him next week. And I, and I told him where my next series is headed. Where Today is the, is the conclusion. The change that took place in, in Brittany's life is the conclusion to our 13-week series about the change. Uh, and I told Danny, I says, I says uh, the week after, I'm going to begin a new series, Power of a Seed. He said, what? I said, what? Come on, talk, tell me like you tell me. I said, what? <laughs> Man, you're killing me, man. But uh, we are going to start a new series, The Power of a Seed. And, and uh, I, I'm telling you, I, I told you all the very first message that I preached on the change, God had already began to download the seed, which I didn't know it was going to be. 14 weeks later, 15 weeks later, whatever it comes out to be, God was already beginning to download that information into me. And so I, I'm, I'm pumped about it. I'm excited. I'm excited to hear what Danny, he's already kind of given me a little bit of what he's going to share next week. And so 
I'm feeling excited about it. I'm a little pumped. I, I'm going to be here. As long as it's not raining, <laughs> I'll be here. But um, <clears throat> April the 7th, um, for those of you that don't know, on April the 11th of 1984 was the beginning of, of New Covenant. And uh, when, when Charles and Sandra stepped out on, on faith and began New Covenant Church, that was 35 years ago. And we are going to celebrate on Sunday, April the 7th. As usual, we'll have dinner after the service. And so I want to encourage you to be here. I want to encourage you to, to bring your friends, your neighbors, your sisters, your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, your dog, cat. Well, don't bring your cat. I don't like like cats. You can bring your dog. I'm good with dogs. But uh, April the 7th, we're going to have an awesome time celebrating the 35th year of this ministry and uh, where, where God began this ministry and where God has taken this ministry, where this ministry is headed. God is, God is doing some awesome things. If you can't tell that, I don't know what is going on you 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 blind I, I can't help you but uh god is doing some radical changes i want to introduce my sister-in-law to you her name is Brittany singleton she is a mother she is a wife she is a mighty mighty woman of god i get to call her my sister-in-law and uh that's a tall order carrying him around but uh she's from she she's actually from the same hometown as my father-in-law and my mother-in-law longview texas <laughs> uh she is a graduate of east texas christian school is that right East Texas Christian School. And, and I don't want to take away from her testimony because, like I said, God radically changed her life. She was headed down the wrong road, and God set her free. Amen. And so it, it takes a commitment on her part, and I'm sure she'll share that. But I, I took a quote from her, and I, I want you to, because this is her life. This is how she lives. She says, I am a child of God, and I am free from the curse. Amen. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I am more than a conqueror. The best decision that I ever made was giving my heart to Jesus. So y'all put your hands together and stand up for Miss Brittany Singleton. I want to say uh, a couple of thank yous first. I want to thank Mike and Tina for having me. Um, I want to thank Sandra and Pastor Wolf uh, just for starting this, this ministry and this church. And uh, I was praying for you and your family today, this morning, early this morning. Well, kind of early. I woke up late, but <laughs> early for me. And, uh, and um, I just began to prophesy over Dylan and uh, Dallas and your boys that just the ceiling that Pastor Wolf reached would be would be all floor that you are going to go even higher. And um, and I'm so grateful for Pastor Wolf just because he led my husband to the Lord. And so many years ago, had he not led him to the Lord at 19, then our paths would have never have crossed. So um, I also want to thank my awesome in-laws, Marion and Thad Singleton. Thank you guys for loving me and welcoming me into your family and welcoming me into your home and always being so um, just full of love, full of grace, grateful you never gave up on my husband. Um, and then my Longview people are here. Y'all, my friends are so good that they drove. They woke up at 6, probably 530, 4, 4 to come watch me speak. And um, Lori, I, I had a word for you as well that all this pain that you're going through, there is purpose in it. And you have a, such a high calling of God on your life and your destiny is so big. And that's why the adversity and the pain is so strong because the call of God on your life is so strong. And thank you, Strader. Um, I love y'all. Oh my gosh, I love y'all. Are y'all ready? Yes. All right, listen. 
can, yeah. Okay, so this is um, a collage of my mug shots. Um, there's 21 and they don't make a collage that big. So um, just to get this out of the way, I have been arrested 21 times. Um, I, I'm a two time felon. Um, I, I was very, very lost and very broken and very addicted. And God set me free. <laughs> I'd like you to turn with me on your Bible app. <laughs> I know y'all ain't got Bibles. You're like getting your phone. Um, Luke chapter 15 is what I'm going to be preaching out of today. I'm going to read this story and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how it relates to my own life. To illustrate the point further, so G first of all, Jesus is telling this story. So we know it's important. We know we need to pay attention, right? Because Jesus is talking about it. And the first sentence he says is to illustrate this point further. So in other words, he's trying to make a point. <clears throat> Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now. Somebody say now. 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 I want it now. Give it to me now. Before you die, which was kind of weird back in that time. You know, the, the estate went to the to the sons, but it was not, it was usually the older son, not the younger son. And it was usually after the father passes away, but he says now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, his younger son packed all of his belongings and moved to a distant land, say a distant land. <laughs> and there he wasted all of his money. Look at your neighbor, say all of it, not half of it, not, not a quarter of it, but all of it in wild living. Some of y'all been there about the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded, persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into his field to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was a long way off. His father saw him coming and filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him and kissed him. His son said to him, father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and now he's returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Now I'm going to go up to Luke chapter 15, verse seven. It says in the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents <clears throat> so good and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and have not strayed away. Yeah. Amen. Holy Spirit, I thank you so much, Father God, for just just for the miracle that you did in my life, God, for setting me free, literally out of prison, out of my chains and my shackles. God, you put my feet on the rock and I pray today, Father God, that you would just open the hearts of the people listening. I pray that you would whisper in their ear to come away with you, to come to you, to come to you, that you are the key. You are the answer to every question. It is Jesus and it will always be Jesus. In Jesus name. Amen. amen. All right. So, oh, I wanted to shout out to my mom and dad too, for having me. Thank you, mom and dad. They're probably watching. From <laughs> thank you. I called them this morning. I was like, Hey, I just wanted to say thank you for thinking dad was hot. <laughs> 
<laughs> she was like, oh, I still think your dad's hot. I was like, that's gross. Got to go. Love you. Bye. <laughs> um, okay. So I was born on May the 20th. Is Connie here? Aunt Connie, we got the same birthday. Hey, May the 20th, 1985. Um, I'm pretty sure that my parents enrolled me in Christian school the day after I was born. Um, if they had like newborn Christian school, I was in it. Um, I got, I, I was always in church. I like to joke around that I had a drug problem before I had a drug problem because my parents would drag me to church and I'm kicking and screaming, but... Um, I grew up in a good Christian home. Um, my mom was a little bit more of a believer than my dad. My dad was kind of, she was working on him. You know, he didn't go to church always. He slept some Sundays, but sometimes he came. Um, <clears throat> I got saved on August the 13th, 1998. I gave my heart to Jesus. Um, I was in Hot, Hot Springs, Arkansas. I was at a kid's summer camp and they did a re-enactment uh, of the crucifixion and they brought an actor that, you know, was beaten and bloodied and, and they were just whipping him and, and whipping him. And I was thinking in my heart, like, oh my goodness, like this man did this for me. You know, it was a, it was a powerful moment for a 13 year old girl. And I remember just thinking, man, I, I want to live my life for Jesus. I, I don't, I want to, he did all this for me. I, I want to live for him. So I asked Jesus to come into my heart that night. I cried and cried. I think I was up until about two o'clock in the morning, just crying and thanking God for saving me. And, uh, I, I like to say that I was sealed for redemption that day. Um, but I was always a rebellious child. I was always in trouble at school. Um, I never did what people asked me to do, you know, and I got a lot of spankings in school. They don't do that anymore. But at my Christian school, they were like, spare the rod, spoil the child, you know. Um, and uh, I got a lot of spankings growing up. I was very rebellious in nature. Um, and I remember in high school, I was still at a Christian school and I remember having a relationship with God in high school, but peer pressure is so strong on these teenagers, you know, and, and there's so much around you saying to look like this and act this way. And, you know, don't wear, don't be modest. And, you know, but let me tell y'all something modest is hottest. Okay. Amen. <laughs> That's for the teenagers. Modest is hottest. Um, Anyway, so I was very influenced in high school by the world. Um, I started hanging out with the wrong crowd that went to a different school. I kind of started straying away from my private school buddies that, that we sought God together. And I kind of started running around with, you know, bad influences, people who smoked weed, stuff like that. And, um, and I ended up, um, when I was 17 years old, I got pregnant. And, um, so here I am, I'm a senior in high school and I'm pregnant and, um, I, and I'm thinking in my head, well, I need to get married because then, you know, it'll, it'll be fine if I get married, you know? So I got married. So, um, in 2003, September the 29th, I gave birth to, um, the most beautiful girl you've ever seen in your life. Her name is Madison. She's here on the front row right now. She's the only person I know that has a Nike dress. I'm like, it's so cute. I'm like, is that a Nike dress? Like, that is really cute. Um, anyways, so my senior year, 2003, I got married and I had to go to school that Monday. I got married on a Saturday and I had to be at school on a Monday. So I'm married in high school. I have a baby and, um, I got called to the office one day and the principal said, Brittany, um, you know, we, we had a school board meeting this morning and um, even though you're graduating salutatorian, we're going to have to ask you to leave the school campus. We're not, you can't walk the stage um, and we're going to give you your diploma, but you will not be honored at graduation. And so, um, that was when I really started hating Christians, I think in my heart, you know, um, I, I, I let this bitterness grow up inside of me that, you know, why can't they just love me the way I am? I, I did the right thing, right? I got married, you know, I did what y'all say to do. Um, and they weren't all like that. Shout out. They weren't all like that, but some of them were. Um, so I ended up 
getting my diploma and starting my married life with um, an abusive man. My husband was very abusive physically, uh, mentally, verbally. There were drugs in our marriage, so that made it even worse. Um, and I would always confide in his mother, my mother-in-law, and tell her, like, man, I messed up. I need to stop this. I got a baby, you know, and I really felt to my heart like I was failing Madison in a lot of ways. Well, she ended up taking me to court when Madison was a little girl and um, we were in what's called a mediation. And while we were in this mediation, they were waiting for my drug test results to come in. And we were gonna decide at that moment what we're gonna do with this baby. And um, so we're in this room, my, I'll never forget it. The facts is like, and the, and the paper comes through and I'm like, okay, my whole life is weighing on this paper. And my lawyer walks over there. She pulls the paper out of the fax machine and she says, well, you just lost Madison. It's positive. And I dropped to my knees and that was the day I just started wailing, crying, you know, and that was the day that I dropped my identity as a good Christian girl and I picked up the identity and the shame of a drug addict. I like to say that those days were like a dark black hole and they were just sucking me deeper and deeper and deeper in because I thought in my mind, I don't have my daughter. I might as well go all out. I've already lost everything. I've already messed up my life. I'm just going to go. I'm going to keep going. I'm, I'm just going to go. And I was that kind of person that if somebody hurt me, I would say, I'll show you. I'll kill me. I'll show you. I'll go kill me. You know, and I and I hurt the people. I, I thought that I was hurting them, but I was really hurting myself. I was foolish. I was blind. At 23 is the first time that I went to prison. From 18 to 23, I was probably arrested, I don't know, four or five times. And uh, at 23, when I first turned 21, I, and can I be real with y'all? Can I just be real with y'all? Is that okay? Is that okay? I'm going to be super vulnerable. I'm going to tell y'all some things that y'all are probably going to be like, oh, but I, I don't care because let me tell you something. I can talk about the old me because that's not me. That's not who I am today. So I can talk about the old me and the things she did, but she's dead. Yes. That girl is dead and I'm alive in Christ. So when I was 22, I met this man and, um, and he was much, much older than me. He was probably about 20 years older than me. He was in his forties. And, um, I started sleeping with this man and this man said, Hey, you know, you're a beautiful girl, Brittany. Like you could be a model. Like you could, you're a beautiful girl. I, I could pay you, you know, if you'll come over and just show me a good time, you know, I'll pay you. And, and I sold my soul basically. To, to this man, you know, and, um, and then he, you know, he said, he called me one day and he said, Hey, I've got a great idea. You need to get out of your parents' house. I've got an apartment. I've got a car. I'm going to introduce you to this guy. He's a doctor in town and he's married. So you can't say anything, but if you'll see him twice a week, we'll pay all your bills. We'll pay your car note. You know, we'll, we'll do all of this. And so, and, and now looking back, I see what it was, but at the time I'm thinking, Oh, I get to get my nails done. I like my hair blonde. You know, I like to tan that costs money, you know, and little by little, I started selling my body to these two men for money. And the Bible talks about that. It's okay. Y'all can breathe. <laughs> it's okay. Everybody breathe. Um, the Bible even says uh, in chapter um, chapter 15, the same, the same chapter, the older son is talking and he's like, and all the time that I was with you, you never gave me anything, but this son of yours goes and squanders his money on prostitutes, you know, so it's, it's in the Bible. It's okay. Um, so 
this man that I was introduced to, um, I stole his checkbook and I stole a lot more from him. I was always stealing his computers, his checkbooks, his, you know, all this stuff. And he ended up pressing charges on me. And so at 23 years old, I'm going to prison for the first time. And while I was in prison, I got served papers for Madison saying, basically, I lose like everything. Like you're in prison. You have screwed up your life. Like it's over. And I remember while I was in prison, um, I was gone for 16 months and I used to love to draw and I would just, I would just write Madison all over everything. Madison, Madison. I love Madison. I got to get home to Madison. If I could just get right for Madison, I got to live my life right. Cause I'll get Madison back. I just got to get Madison back. And she was, she was my, uh, focus and just my everything while I was in there. And what I should have done was put my nose in, in the Bible and then I would have read that he will send your children home from afar and I would have got some truth. But at that time I was mad at God. Honestly, I was mad at God. I really was. I was mad because of how I was treated as a teenager. I was mad that these, you know, Christians say they're one way and then they act another. And, and, you know, I, I was angry with God. So, uh, 16 months goes by, you would think I would get some act right in me, but I get out and I go right back. Um, I, from about, um, I was out, I was out long enough to get pregnant with Maverick and Macy and that straightened me up for a little while, but, um, Maverick and Macy are my eight year old twins. And when I got pregnant with them, um, I was like, man, I can't do this. I already lost one kid. You know, I'm no good. I kept on, I told everybody when I found out I was pregnant, I said, man, I'm no good at this mom thing. Man, I'm no good at this. And I contacted Planned Parenthood in Shreveport. Um, I drove to Planned Parenthood and, and my plan was to have an abortion. So I go in Planned Parenthood, I'm going through all the motions and they're like, okay, when you come in that day, we'll give you a, a, some medicine. It'll calm your nerves. We'll be able to do our procedure, blah, blah, blah. Just lie, 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 lie. And, and of course I'm buying into it, you know? And, um, they said, but the first thing we got to take you in this room, we got to give you a sonogram and we got to even verify that you're pregnant because some women come in here, they're not pregnant, blah, blah, blah. So they take me in there, they're doing the little sonogram and, um, the lady doing it goes, Oh, and I'm like, what, what was that? And she was like, well, there's two babies in your womb. And I was like, Oh man, I can't do this. I got to get out of here. And I just ran out. I was like, I can't do this, you know, and thank God, God has shown me now that where sin abounds, much more grace abounds. And in that moment I was in a sinful environment. There was sin everywhere, but his grace for me caused me to get up. And I literally ran out of that place. I had the goo on my belly and everything. And I was like, I got to get out of here. I can't do this to two babies, you know? But that's just to show you what kind of state of mind that I was in. Um, I have Maverick and Macy. You would think that having a set of twins would straighten you up, right? Surely you can straighten up after having one child taken. Now you got two children, but I escalated deeper and deeper into darkness and deeper and deeper into sin. And I really started at some point after Maverick and Macy were born, I became an intravenous drug user. And that opened up so much. It, it blurred the line between reality and spirit world. And it was crazy because I found myself in this spiritual battle and I was on the dark side, you know, I, and, and I know I'm going to die. I mean, a little part of me says, if you don't get out of this, you're going to die. And how foolish it is to keep going and to keep going. But let me tell you something. God's love was chasing me. And even in my darkest hour, he was beckoning me saying, come to me, come to me. I would hear little voices in my spirit say, you're, you were created for more than this, Brittany. You are a child of God. Don't you remember when you were 13? 
So uh, in January of 2012, um, 2012 was basically the worst year of my life. I met Kristen Strader during that year. Um, and she, y'all, y'all may be sitting there thinking, yeah, right. Look at her and her lipstick and nice clothes like this. Th that can't, that's not for me. That's for her. That's not for me. But um, I have a friend here who was in the same pit, same darkness, and God plucked her out with his mighty hand. She ran to our church one night. Her and her boyfriend were fighting. She ran to our church and she said, call Brittany Major, call Brittany Major. And they were like, she was beat up. She had ribs broken. She was bleeding out of her face. She had bruises all over. Her. And they call me and I'm in San Diego. And they're like, there's a girl here. She's asking for you. She's beat up really bad. <laughs> Anyways, um, she got accepted into a ministry called Restored 180, and her whole life has changed. Her whole, she don't do drugs no more. She's completely free from all, she works for the ministry now. So it's awesome. I'm telling you, he can and he will turn your life around. Okay, so back to where I was at. So it's 2012 in January. I live, at this time, my parents call the police every time they see me. If I come to their house, they call the police. If I um, come to their business, they call the police. Like, they're done with me. That's probably... Two of those were probably because they did it. And um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mom and Dad. I know why now. Um, and so um, it, I'm, I live in hotels mainly, like hotels on Highway 80. I'm, I pay rent every night and I sell just enough drugs or I sell my body just enough to uh, support. And it's just a, a continual chaotic. I'm on the streets. I mean, I live on the streets straight up. That's what it was. And, um, and we're all listening to rap music and we used to listen to this demonic rap music and we're just glorifying the devil, listening to all this devil music. And some of the guys are freestyling, you know, and somebody, and I go to the door and I open it and it's a girl that I know. And she says, major don't met. She pulls a gun out and she goes, don't mess with this gun. This gun is loaded. And I said, okay, I won't mess with it, you know. And I'm sitting there, and we're just hanging out, freestyling, hanging out, listening to rap music. And not that rap music is bad, but there's Christian rap music that I listen to now, okay? Um, and uh, and she pulls out this gun, points it at me, cocks it, it's a revolver, boom, and pulls the trigger. And the bullet goes right by my head. And it hits the wall behind me, and the wall behind me goes poof with uh, gunpowder. And, and anyway, my ear, from where it hit, it burned up the top of my ear, the cartilage of my ear. And it was the loudest noise I've ever heard. It was just whoa! I mean, it was super loud. And I knew that day in January, if I didn't get out, I would die. If I did not get off these streets, they were going to kill me. I was going to be dead because I had light in me. I was saved. And I know that may be hard for y'all to understand, but I was saved. I was bought with the blood of Jesus, but I was mad at God and I was backsliding and I was holding my fist saying, why do you treat people like this? And it wasn't him. It was people <laughs> and people are jacked up. You know, we're all jacked up. We're all messed up. You know, we all got issues. Amen. And, uh, Anyways, a few days later, and I struggled with it. I, I, I think that I had some post-traumatic stress disorder because the devil was telling me that wasn't real. You didn't really get, you didn't really almost die. That wasn't real. And I'm thinking, was that, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, was it real? What just happened, you know? And um, I went to Hastings and I saw my best friend from high school. And her name is Courtney Hutton. Courtney, if you're watching, I love you so much. You're so awesome. You're amazing. Love you. Love you. Thank you for not giving up on me. I saw my best friend from Hastings in Hastings. I mean, my best friend from high school in Hastings. Da -da 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 -da. And um, she says, what happened to your ear? 
And I was like, man, bro, I got shot at the other night. And she was like, what? I was like, yeah, man, we were all hanging out. This girl pulled out a gun. I don't know, I guess she was trying to kill me. I don't know. And she was like, Brittany, what are you doing? So she, I leave, I'm like, hey, I gotta go. I gotta go, see you later. And I get in the car and she goes to my parents' house. And she says, she knocks on my parents' door and she said, man, yo, we gotta pray for Brittany. We got to pray for Brittany. It's bad. It's bad. Listen, she just got shot at. It's bad. We got to pray for her. We got to pray for her because she might die. She might die if we don't, you know. And um, she began to pray for me. My parents were praying for me. Um, and for one year almost, I continue in this lifestyle. I continue deeper and deeper. And it got real bad after I got shot at because that made me lose my mind because I would think all the time, who tried to kill me? Why did they try to kill me? What, did I owe somebody money? Did I steal something from the wrong person? Is that a hit man? Was it a hit? Was it an assignment? And, and now I know it was a hit man. It was an assignment. It was a demon. It was demons. It was demonic. There was an assignment from hell on my life take her because if she gets right <laughs> whoo, if she gets right man she's gonna change the world she'll turn the world upside down we got to keep her trapped I mean that's what it was an assignment from hell keep her in keep her in keep her trapped keep her trapped so which would lead me to um, December the 31st. Y'all y'all can relax now. It's about to get better. <laughs> I'm finna get saved, okay? Or I'm finna return to God. <laughs> okay. So December the 31st, 2013. What's December the 31st? New Year's Eve. Oh, I got some. Y'all be partying, don't y'all? <laughs> which the Holy Spirit totally had to pick the day that everybody in the world parties, then I'm not going to be partying that day, right? Um, so it was divine sobriety day. <laughs> so I am, it's New Year's Eve. I have a pair of six inch stilettos from TJ Maxx and a purse. And I'm hanging out with this guy and we're running all over the place. And he's, my friend used to call him the evil dark Lord. <laughs> he's bad off evil on drugs, you know, sells drugs, does drugs, lures beautiful women in the, you know, he's crazy. Sorry, but he is. Yeah. Holy Spirit, get him in the name of Jesus. Pull him out of the pit. So um, we're hanging out. It's New Year's Eve. We're partying. We're going from house to house to house. And uh, I, he falls asleep and I'm not done partying. Okay. So I reach over and Stick my hand in his pocket and boop, got his keys. And I get in the car and I'm driving all over Longview, Gladewater, White Oak, Hallsville, Gilmer. And I'm just, I was with a girl originally and she got out of the car and I just burned out on her. I just left her, just left her, you know? And um, so I'm by myself and I'm listening to voices. And I want to talk to you a little bit about listening to the right voice. Because I'm listening to these voices and they're saying, kill yourself. You are no good. Just run out in front of a car tonight. Just do it. You are too far gone. You're never coming back. You're never getting your kids back. You're going to go to prison again. You are worthless. You are pitiful. And these voices are telling me, turn left on this street and go down there. Turn right on this street. And I'm literally listening to voices telling me where to drive this car. And I'm beat down. I'm broken. I'm depressed. I'm in a stolen vehicle at this point. He's probably called the police because I stole his car. I'm, I'm probably about to go to jail. And I find myself stuck in a mud pit, just like the prodigal. 
I'm in this mud and I'm going Rawr! and the wheels are just spinning, spinning mud, spinning mud. So at this point I get out of the car and I'm just treading through this mud, trying to get out of this mud pit. It's raining. I'm on somebody's property because I can see a house in the distance. And I'm like, man, what am I going to do? I'm stuck in a mud pit. Pretty soon after I ruined my TJ Maxx stilettos and I got mud all over my face, it's on my arms. I'm like sticking trees under the tire trying to, trying to get, I'm like going out in the woods, like breaking branches, like trying to get enough surface to like get up out of this mud pit. And I hear whoop whoop and I'm like, okay, here we go. And oftentimes I love the police. Oh my goodness, Dylan, you are a good man. I love y'all. I really do. I didn't, I haven't always, but, <laughs> but the Lord has told me that those were my angels. Those were my angels and they were on assignment to you. They were coming for you. And just because they have a police badge on don't mean that I didn't send them. I sent them to you. I sent them to save your life. And looking back, there were so many times where I went to jail and I got arrested and I was so mad at God, you know, but really it was him who said, oh, you're going to die if you go this way. I'm going to sit you down for a little while, you know, child, when are you going to be done? You know? So I am, um, I get arrested, um, for unauthorized use of a motor vehicle, possession of a controlled substance, four to 200 grams, possession of drug paraphernalia, possession of a dangerous drug. And I'm like, okay, this is it for me. There is no way. I, this is my 21st time to be arrested. This is my second felony. There's no coming back from this. So I literally, the cop came over to me and I said, hey man, I got, I got some stuff in my pocket. Like, this is not my car. Let's just get this over with. Like, here you go. You know? And um, so I'm in, I'm booked into jail and um, I haven't slept for probably 10, 10 days. I haven't eaten anything. I'm hungry, you know? And I remember falling asleep and um, needing to sleep. And when I woke up, I was like, man, I'm gonna go get all this mud off of me. You know, I'm gonna take a shower, get this mud off me. So I took a shower. I come out to the day room of the jail and they, the, the jailers come in and they say, hey, church, does anybody wanna go to church? And I'm like. <laughs> and I walk. And I'm sitting in this jail church service and Janice Easley walks in and Janice Easley shout out to you. You were the Ananias that laid hands on me and said, receive your sight, brother Paul. So she walks in and she's like, and I'm sitting like this. I got my arms crossed. I am a hardened criminal. I don't care what this lady has to say. You know, I don't care. And I'm sitting there with my arms crossed and she goes, you know, I've been fasting and I've been praying and I've been hearing God and I've been seeing things in my spirit. And she said, you, God was right there with you when you were trapped in that mud pit. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, y'all. I was, I broke. I felt like my face cracked down the middle. And this mask just crumbled. And I began to cry. And I was like, at, in that moment, God became real to me. Yeah. He became real to me because not only was He with me, but he was with me in a stolen vehicle with drugs in my pocket in a mud pit, the worst that I had ever been off in my mind. I, I'm out of my mind and God is right there. And she looks at me and she goes, do you want to go to the throne of grace? And I was like, <laughs> yeah. and she said, stand up. And I stood up and I was like, <laughs> She said, 
repeat after me. And I started just a normal, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Make me a different person. I don't want to live my life like this anymore. And that is the day that the Father, the Father was waiting on the porch. And I'm in this mud like, man, I'm created for more than this. There's got to be more to life than this, than going to jail again and again, losing my kids, losing my mind, selling my body for drugs, for money. There's got to be more to life than this. And I came to my senses in that jail cell, and I thought, surely, surely God will forgive me. Surely I haven't gone too far, and I'm not too far gone. Let me tell y'all something. Too far gone and gone too far is the kind my God likes. That's his first round draft pick for the kingdom. That's the ones that he's going, man, when they get it together, whoo, they radical in the world. Wait till I, I get a hold of them. So I want to encourage you with this. Um, bad news came first in my story. OK, and sometimes we come to this altar and what this altar is, it's a place to get right with God. We all need to get right with God. We all need to just take a moment and come up here and just say, God, I know I did some things this week that, you know, didn't please you. And I just want to get right. You know, it's, it's OK to come up here, get right with God. It's a good thing. I used to come to the altar at my church every Sunday and I was the only one. I was the only one up there doing this. <laughs> and now the altars are flooded. But it started with one. Yeah. So I'm in my jail cell and I'm like, well, I'm a Christian now. And they call my name, Brittany Major. I'm like, oh, this Jesus stuff works. Says I'm finna go home. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> and they said, here, we need you to sign this. It's termination papers on your children. And in that moment, I wanted to say, oh, now you want to take my kids? But I didn't. I remember I, I got angry and then I was like, God, I don't trust my own ways. I don't trust taking matters into my own hands. I, every time I do, I mess it up. So I said yesterday that I was going to serve you for the rest of my life. And I meant it. And if you want me to serve you without my kids, then so be it. And I went over to my bunk and I laid in my bunk and I mourned the death of my children because it felt like that. It felt like they were taking my children from me. And it was a gut wrenching, horrible, terrible pain. And I cried for a whole day. I didn't eat. I didn't drink. I cried and cried and no one could comfort me. I had people coming over to my bunk. Hey, Major. Hey, you want some water? And I'm just like, man, leave me alone. Leave me alone. Let me let me cry this thing out. So when I woke up, I thought, OK, God, here I am. I'm going to serve you. And I heard a voice say, welcome home. And I was like, and I mean, God began to talk to me like y'all talked to me. I felt it in my heart. And he was saying, I've been waiting for you. I love you. I'm going to set you free out of this jail cell. I'm going to bring your kids home. <laughs> and I'm running with it. I'm like, okay, if you think you can set me free from this jail cell, so be it. But I'm in a lot of trouble, God. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I figured I should get a Bible, right? So I'm like looking around the tank. And, you know, when I went to jail, they took my glasses. They took my earrings. They took my shoes. They took my shirt. They took everything, my jewelry. They took everything, but they gave me one thing. They took nothing, and they gave me everything. And I, I consider it all loss to know Christ. So I open this Bible and my new adventure into Christianity. I just open it. He will bring your children home from afar. 
I mean, just like that. And in that moment, it was reality. I mean, it was, this book was literally speaking into my situation. You just lost your kids. He will bring them home. Okay. I mean, so I, I began to read this book and it says, he will set the prisoner free. And some of y'all read that and you don't realize, man, this book is alive. It has a heartbeat. It has flesh. This is Jesus. It breathes. It breathes. It breathes. And all you got to do is open it. And it, it is God. He will speak to you. But he's not going to speak to you without you opening this book. It's an important part of the Christian walk and the Christian life. So... Then I thought in another verse that says, he will lead the prisoner out with singing. (laughs) So I'm like, Jesus, I'm singing all the time. Lover of my soul. (laughs) And man, y'all, I get in this book. I get, I get in this book. I'm reading it from the minute I wake up to the minute I go to bed. I got a card and I'm just underlining everything. I'm highlighting everything. I'm reading and reading. And we had a TV in our tank. And I told God, I'm done with the world. I'm turning my back to that TV. I got a chair. I turned my back to the TV and I just read the word of God. I was done with CSSI, The Voice, American Idol. I mean, all that. I didn't care, man. I was in this book. And man, God began to just, whoo, he began to speak to me and he, and he kept saying, I'm going to set you free out of this jail cell. And I'm like, how? This is, this is amazing, you know? But thank God we did have TBN. We had cable in, in the jail. And so I would turn it to TBN and I got saved every day. I probably got saved. <laughs> <laughs> had messed up so bad that I was like, Jesus, here I am again. <laughs> Come into my heart. Save me. Make me a different person every day. I mean, because because I was a bad girl. You know, I really needed I needed it. And every time Joe Osteen led a prayer, I was there. Every time Joseph Prince led, I mean, and they always did at the end of the show. I was like, oh, that's me again. <laughs> Sometimes I still do it at church. He'll be like, okay, repeat after me. And I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> In case it didn't work the 5,279 times, here I am again. (laughs) Um, So I went to court. I know i got to hurry for time. Um, So I went to court, and the first offer they gave me was 10 years, TDC. And I'm like, oh, man. So I brought my Bible to court, and I said, hey, but it says right here in Isaiah chapter 61, I did this. They thought I was crazy. I I really did. I said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives shall be released. And they're like, what do you want to do, Brittany? And I'm like, I'm going home. (laughs) And they're like, they just put my court date off again, you know? (laughs) So the next time they call me to court, Brittany Major, I'm like, whoo, bless the Lord on my soul. I'm going home today. I'd come in there with my Bible, you know, just reading my Bible while they're talking. And they come in there and they're like, okay, we're offering. Oh, there's Connor. Oh, sweet little Connor. I got a picture of Connor picking his nose. (laughs) <laughs> or he's not picking his nose, but <laughs> okay. So, um, the second time they're like, okay, we've decided that you need rehab. <laughs> you think, you know, so we're going to send you to, um, Bowie County treatment center. Um, and then you're going to go start your TDC time, but you'll probably parole out in like four to five years. And I'm like, ah, right here it says that Jesus is going to set me free and that when Paul and Silas were praising in the midnight hour the foundations of the prison started shaking and the chains fell off the prisoners and they walked out free so they put my court date off again and I am like I am 
like on fire for God. And I have a girl in my tank and she was maybe, uh, maybe practice witchcraft. And she would always come up to me and she'd go, Hey, I'm coming to your house and we're going to build this and that. And I'd be like, you're not coming to my house because my house is filled with the Holy Ghost. And it was just this spiritual battle all the time. <laughs> and, um, and, and, <laughs> This girl came in one night and she was crazy. She really was crazy. She was talking about a little red guy that she saw running around. And um, and I decide, because I'm a Christian now, that I am going to give her some of my things. Okay? So I get her a t-shirt and a pair of panties and some, I pour some shampoo and some conditioner and little bottles. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be a Christian. So I get a towel and I pick up the towel and I wrap it in the towel and I throw it over my shoulder and I'm walking over to give it to her. And God says, stop. He said, turn around and go give her everything that you were going to keep for yourself. And you keep What's in that towel? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, Jesus. So I go over and I lift up my mattress and I put it on the floor and I just start piling all this stuff in my sheet. And I'm like, man, this is maybe the most crazy thing I've ever done. So be careful when you give somebody something, God may switch it up. Like, uh, -uh that watch you were going to keep, you give that to her. So I wrap up all this stuff, throw it over my shoulder like Santa Claus, walk over to her and I said, hey, and I always say this, my friends know this, I always say, I don't want to weird you out or anything because <laughs> it can get a little weird when you're talking about the Holy Ghost and <laughs> God talks to me and, you know, it's kind of, it can get some, it gets weird. My mom was a weirdo like that and it always embarrassed me. So I would say, hey, I don't want to weird you out or nothing. <laughs> but God talks to me. I have this weird thing. God talks to me and I feel like in my heart, he told me to give you this stuff. And she's just looking through it like, amazed, you know? So I go back to my bunk and, um, I have this little bitty bottle of shampoo, this little, I got one pair of panties and I'm like, you know, and my, all my stuff was my pillow. So when I went to bed that night, like I'm laying flat, you know, <laughs> and, um, the next day, Brittany major court. So I get up, I don't have anything to put on. So I just <laughs> walk out. And, uh, when we got into the courtroom, um, the prosecutor on my case was not there and it was another guy and he was bald headed. And, um, I asked my lawyer, I said, who's that guy? He said, well, your prosecutor on your case dropped your case this morning <laughs> and a new prosecutor picked up your case and the new guy over there is offering you four years probation wow. today. <laughs> wow. And I told myself, God, if you really do this, <laughs> then I promise whenever they tell me that I'm getting out, I'll drop to my knees and I'll thank you. So they said that, and I just went, you know, and I said, God, thank you. I know you did this. I know you did this. I will never, ever, ever go back into the world. I'm never going back. Um, I have so much more, but I've got to cut it for time's sake. But, um... The real test starts when the breakthrough happens. I always tell my husband, listen, this is a test and daddy is watching. This is a test and daddy is watching. And y'all, drugs have just come to me. I have found them places at my job place, this and that. And I'll pick them up and I'll say, God, I know you're watching me. And I know, you know what I've been praying about. I need victory on Friday. You know what it is. And I'm going to flush these drugs down that toilet. And you come through for me, okay, God? I know you will. And I'll flush them. Ugh! I'm done with that stuff. Man, I'm done. I'm done. And you can be done, too. You can be free, too. I'm going to tell you the three 
practical things that I did when I got out. I picked a time to pray every day. Every night, I said, at 7 o'clock tonight, I'm praying, no matter what happens. I picked a place to pray. I had a little area of my room, a little area, and um, I would go in that place at 7 o'clock every night, and then I would pray out loud. And I fell in love with Jesus doing that. I fell in, and He showed up every night. Sometimes I'd get there late, and He'd go, I've been waiting on you. <laughs> I'm like, I know, I know. <laughs> and I'd tell my friends that come over, I'd be like, come here, I want to show you this area in my room. Be careful. If you step in, you might get healed. You want <laughs> <laughs> The glory is in there. <laughs> Um, and the first time that I gave my testimony to the world, it was August the 20th, 2016. A lot of people showed up and um, my parents were there and I was going to be sharing about some sensitive stuff about, you know, the, you know, selling my soul and, and those kind of things. But God told me, you can talk about the old you, Brittany. That's not you anymore. You know, and, and so the first time I ever came in front of the world to speak, there was a guy sitting in the crowd. His name is Mitch Singleton. <laughs> I love you, baby. <laughs> I love you so much. Um, and he elbowed his friend and he said, hey, I think I'm going to marry that girl. <laughs> and then we didn't talk to each other for two years, but we started working at the same place. And then we were like, let's get married. <laughs> And we kept ourselves pure. We waited until we were married. Amen. And it's so beautiful, y'all. I just encourage you, if you are a single person in this place, wait, wait. wait. It is so worth it. It makes it so special and so beautiful. And I'm telling you, and if you've blown it, so have I, okay? If you've blown it, that's okay. Just get back up. Make a decision in your relationship. Hey, we've blown it, but let's do it right. Let's do it right this time. Yeah. <clears throat> and you never know if you decide to get your testimony give your testimony to the world who's going to be watching so all right i want to close with this verse <laughs> thank you let me find it all right it is i took so many notes a couple really I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. In other words, you got to die. You got to lay your life down. You have to lay your life down. And that's why so many people don't make it because they're not willing to to die. I used to joke around, God's not trying to hurt you, he's trying to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so, he so he can raise you up again. That's exactly right. So the old you can die. And, and if you have something that you struggle with, pornography, drugs, alcohol, and, and it's bondage, you know, and you may get good for a little while, but then you fall back and then you may get good for a little while, you really want to take a look at your life, you know, because I'm telling you, there's a, there's a high cost for low living. You don't want to live like that. You don't want to, one day you're going to be face to face with God and he's going to say, what did you do with the time I gave you? And you don't want to say, I was lukewarm. I raise my hands in church sometimes. Man, get up here and raise your hands. Come on. It's time. It's time. You see, to die is gain, and to live is Christ. If I got diagnosed right now with cancer, I would say in my heart, you know what, Jesus? To die is gain. And you got to come to that place in your life where to die is gain. Amen. And to live, all that is, is living for Christ. And Paul even said, huh? 
I'm kind of, I kind of want to die and go be with Jesus, but I know I got to talk to these people and minister, but uh, you know, and I want to be like that. I want to be that kind. I want to be a Paul. Philippians 3, 8 says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And in closing, nothing else matters. Can I pray for them real quick, Pastor Mike? Okay, I want everybody to bow your head and close your eyes. Nobody looking around. I want to pray for the one who relates to my testimony and who says, man, I'm that one. I'm the one. I went too far. I'm on drugs. I drink every night. I, I can't stop going back to my laptop, back to my phone. I cannot quit looking at these images. I cannot stop. It is controlling my life. Or if you're the one who has a family member that is that person or a close friend who is that person and you want to stand in the gap for that family member. You may say, man, Brittany, I've been serving God my whole life, but my daughter is running so far from God. She is. Maybe there's somebody in here that's got a daughter or a son in prison or a brother or a sister in prison. Today, I want you to stand in the gap for them, and we're just going to believe that the power of God is going to hit you. I believe that just by raising your hand, I just believe that the power of God will hit you and that you will have the, the power to stop. I believe that. I believe in moments that change everything. I believe in moments that change the entire course of our destiny. I believe in that kind of stuff. So right now, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm not going to ask you to come up here. I'm not going to embarrass you. But if you know somebody, you have a family member that's addicted to drugs or in prison, or it's you, raise your hand. Hands all over the room. I see all of your hands. I see them all. Holy Spirit, I thank you so much for the, the moments in our life that change everything, God. I thank you, God, that you literally look down looking to save and seek those who are lost. God, I thank you that your heart is after the one lost sinner, God, rather than 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. And God, right now, I pray for every drug addict represented in these families right now in the name of Jesus. Touch them, Lord. Right now, I call every prodigal son home in the name of Jesus. Right now, I prophesy over you that your best days are yet to come, that the best is yet to come. You don't have to live like this, and you're not going to live like this. God, I pray that you would fling wide the chest of these people and fill them with your Holy Spirit. Fill them with your goodness, God. Break the chains of addiction off of their life, God. Set the captive free. Bring the children home. God, I pray for my brother-in-law, Matt Singleton, right now in Jesus' name. God, I pray that you touch him and Lauren right now in Jesus' name. God, come into their lives. Come into their hearts. Seek and save that which is lost today, Holy Spirit. Let it be done in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you all so much for having me. I appreciate it. You like what you're seeing? Are you enjoying the change? Are you enjoying what you're hearing? The Word of God is powerful. It says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It will bring correction into your life. It will bring instruction into your life. I pray that you're being blessed by the Word that you're hearing. If you're being blessed and you know you're being blessed, give us a thumbs up. Share the video. Tell the world about what God is doing here in Port Acres, Texas. I'd love to see you. I'd love to have you here. But if you can't make it to our physical location, you can check us on our website at newcovenantpa.com. You can also check us out at our edited versions on New Covenant Port Author on YouTube. And you can check us out on Facebook at New Covenant PA. I'd love to see you. Have a blessed day.